Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 21st edition of the World Sustainable Development Summit. I am Dhriti Pathak, and I extend my warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today for the thematic track on enablers for SCPCC revision and implementation. The theme for today's discussion is subnational climate action, and we have a very interesting lineup of speakers and panelists for the discussion today. SEPCCs, as we all know, are the drivers of subnational climate action in India. This thematic track, however, brings out not only the experiences of states and youths in the formulation and implementation of their SEPCCs, but also the experiences of countries around the world as a knowledge sharing and discussion platform. So uh, without further ado, let me begin today's session with the welcome address by Mr. Abhishek Kaushik from Terry. Mr. Kaushik is a multidisciplinary researcher working on international climate policy and its relevance to domestic policy making, including issues such as uh, equity, mitigation, market-based approaches, and monitoring, reporting, and verification frameworks. He's also a certified practitioner on GHG protocol corporate standards and has led many projects with a focus on international and domestic climate policy. He's currently a fellow and an area convener at the climate change team at Terry. Over to you, Mr. Kaushik. Thanks, Triti, and uh, good morning to all these distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Terry, I welcome you all for this thematic track on enablers for state action plan on climate change revision and implementation. I think this track is of high important, uh, particularly interesting that uh, currently in India, all the states and union territories are revising uh, their state action plan on climate change. In fact, some have already revised and shared their state action plans with the central ministry. As we all know, climate change becoming increasingly central uh, and important, and uh, there is an a need to have policy planning and implementation at various levels. Uh, we also understand that there is an urgent need for coherence between climate change strategies at the national, subnational, city, and district level. Now, in India, the formulation of the state action plan on climate change has been an important milestone in developing domestic policies around climate change. And SAPCCs are the guiding document for planning climate change actions in the state's planning and processes. We know that in the view of advance in science, evolving climate policy context both nationally and internationally, such as through commitments under NDCs and other priorities of the government, SAPCCs are, be, have, are being revised and strengthened further. A central aspect of SAPCCs is that we intend to mainstream climate change action into local level planning. Mainstreaming climate change have, can have different meanings and understanding depending upon the contextual relevance of an action policy or perception from implementing an incremental action to transformative, transformative policies. However, for any developmental activities to achieve its full potential, mainstreaming climate change concerns have become inevitable. It is further important to note that mainstreaming adaptation is an iterative process and in order to ensure accountability and enhance learning it is essential to have a feedback mechanism since 2010 state governments in india have developed implemented have tested approaches for mainstreaming climate change adaptation mitigation at various levels of governance such so, several approaches have been implemented that are unique in nature and also locally relevant for states and UTs. There is also an interplay between communities, NGOs and governance mechanisms. And there are a number of entities which are involved. In fact, uh, various departments at the state level involved in the development of state action plan on climate change. At this juncture, as I said, because most of the states and UTs are in the process of revising their state action plans, I think through this panel discussion, 
we would like to hear from our eminent speakers uh, to understand some of the ways by which they are revising their state action plans what are the issues and opportunities they see while uh, revising their state action plans and we would like to get uh, through this platform hear from some of the global best practices across the world on how other states outside india uh, are doing and updating their state action plans related to climate change uh, without any further ado uh, i welcome you once again for this interesting session and i look forward to the deliberations thank you thank you abhishek uh, we now have a special address by mr edwin popo Mr Pukuk is the first councillor on energy and climate action in the European Union delegation to India based in New Delhi. He is responsible for cooperation between the European Union and India in the areas of energy and climate action including the implementation of the India EU clean energy and climate partnership. Over to you. Sir. Mr. Edwin. I sorry. Am I audible now? You're audible. Uh, you're audible, Edwin. But. Uh, Um, yes, um, good morning to all of you, a very warm welcome and apologies, there was a technical issue. I hope I'm audible, I understand the connection is not really, really well. Um, um, so, so I'm Edwin Kukuk, working in the EU delegation to India um, and uh, cooperation with India in the area of uh, energy and climate change is uh, among our Key priorities um, in 2016, uh, the uh, uh, EU and India agreed at the highest level the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Climate Partnership. Um, and since then, each year, each year in all our EU-India summits, the importance of this partnership is recognised. And each time, it's said that we should further strengthen strengthen it. We work together in the area of energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, including uh, offshore wind and solar, smart grids, financing, um, 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 and also uh, climate mitigation and uh, adaptation. So as you know, and, and that's also why I'm, I'm, I think today will be a very interesting session. Um, the EU consists of 27 EU uh, member states, uh, larger ones, uh, smaller ones, richer ones, poorer ones, um, uh, countries that are uh, uh, extremely cold in winter, countries that are extremely hot in, 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 uh, in, 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 in summer. Uh, we have 24 languages, different cultures, um, uh, different kitchens. And in that sense, we are... Uh, quite comparable uh, to, to uh, India. Also, our motto is united in diversity. Um, um, I, I think the Indian motto is unity in, the, in, the first, in diversity. Um, and we think it's useful to share knowledge from, from uh, EU member states, 
how they do the, their climate planning, both in the area of uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation, and the uh, Indian states. Um, the session that we are having today is organized under the uh, strategic partnership uh, on the implementation of the Paris Agreement, which is a, which is a project uh, implementing the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership. Uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Climate Change is the nodal ministry, and it's implemented by the delegation of the European Union in close cooperation with GIZ India, and it's financed by the EU and also by, uh, by Germany. Um, today, we, we will discuss um, the uh, enablers for, for, for uh, a successful revision of the state's action plans on climate change. Uh, under the SPIPA project, we have supported uh, five states or union territories with their state action plan. And we think it's also useful uh, to discuss how to ensure successful implementation of the state action plans on climate change, because that's the, the next important step. So now, um, uh, in the coming months, many of the uh, state action plans on climate change will be successfully revised, and that it challenges indeed to, 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 uh, to uh, put it into a reality. And also there, I, I, I think it would be interesting to hear from the, from the uh, colleagues that are already implementing, some of them we, uh, we are from India, but also our uh, colleagues from the EU member states. And I'm very happy to, to announce that today we have representatives, high level representatives from Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, Kerala, Gujarat, uh, Delhi, Pondicherry, and also from uh, uh, the EU member states, um, Austria, Finland, and I also see the German colleague <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, in this session. So, so Thank you very much for joining this. I, I hope we can really focus on, 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 uh, on lessons on how to uh, uh, ensure the revision of the state action plans and how to ensure implementation. Under our SPIPA project, we will also come with a report with the lessons that we learned uh, from the support to the revision in, in, in the states uh, that we supported. And, and I hope that uh, today's uh, deliberation can also feed that uh, uh, report that we will make. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward uh, to your discussion. And um, once again, many thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Hi. Moving on, we have a question. Sites by Ms. Ashish Dupri, the Department of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change in the Government of Uttar Pradesh. It's a member of the Indian Foreign Services with more than 25 years of proven success spanning across policy and planning in senior positions. Over to you, Mr. Tiwari. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this uh, very pertinent discussion on uh, implementation of climate action at sub-regional level. In fact, the state of Uttar Pradesh, I should say, is not a state, it's a country uh, because of its uh, uh, demographic uh, characters, the population which, which it has, the kind of diversity it has, ranging from a very, very urbanized district in the national capital region of Delhi to the very, very rural uh, kind of a district uh, uh, down in the Bundelkhand region. So the implementation of uh, uh, climate action in Uttar Pradesh is really a very, very uh, daunting task. And the state is uh, really devising its, its policies and uh, the action plans based upon uh, based upon the real challenges which are there in the state. We are working upon a kind of five-pronged strategy for 
implementation of uh, uh, climate actions in the state which will be you can say uh, a kind of uh, uh, based upon the best practices which are practiced globally and uh, in uh, the fellow states in our country also as i mentioned we have a very high challenge of urbanized kind of settings and also a very rural settings uh, in the state of uttar pradesh so the state action plan we we thought that would be a guiding kind of a document but really we need to have district action plan for climate change as the guiding uh, documents guiding policies for the district level implementation and to downscale the climate actions and climate planning at the level of gram panchayats very many in number just to mention the figure up has over 58000 gram panchayats where actually the uh, where actually the climate action has to take place so now we have because of diversity in the state we need to have very robust kind of district action plan for climate change and those uh, district plans will become guiding documents for the gram panchayats which are there in the districts our strategy is basically uh, uh, is basically because climate financing is going to be the biggest challenge our experience on implementation of a state action plan for climate change in the state of uttar pradesh and elsewhere also is that the climate financing is the biggest challenge we may have a very robust very good action plan but we need to implement it and we need to have a finances to implement it so the financing part uh, we need to actually uh, review our various development policies for their climate sensitivity and if at all the policies the schemes which are very highly climate sensitive we must take benefit of them we are currently doing this exercise also and those schemes and programs which are not that much of a climate sensitive which are a little bit below in the sensitivity indexing those schemes and programs can be made more climate sensitive by way of some some kind of a, a small tweaking around of the programs and the schemes so this is our first strategy for climate financing second would be of course uh, pooling the resources which are available uh, by way of you can say the uh, uh, by way of uh, the very new thing which was announced in our uh, uh, budget of 21 22 is the green bonds the government is also exploring uh, the climate financing on the green bonds the major strength of the green bonds is that uh, a, we we may have a mechanism for refinancing whatever climate actions we have already taken in the state and the capacity building because as i mentioned the 58 over 58000 gram panchayats have to take up the the climate action so the planning at gram panchayat level we need to have a very robust capacity building and the capacity building package must be must be able to satisfy the training needs of the gram panchayats which are very varied in their characters and very varied in their nature so currently we are developing capacity building is we are organizing capacity building at the gram panchayat level so that actually the uh, climate action uh, a very very effective kind of a climate action can begin at the ground level in a nutshell i should say that the panchamrit the panch tatva of climate action is that first is a state action plan for climate change that that action plan should not be a decorative book uh, in the shelf but it should be a very very actionable kind of thing it must have 
very inclusive approach of uh, of uh, getting into it the views of all the stakeholders and particularly the actors at the ground level that kind of a document we are we have revised for the state of uttar pradesh and now the district level action plans would be our next step capacity building at gram panchayat level and of course the biggest challenge is climate financing because in in our uh, state economies we are not going to get any additional funds we need to look around for funding in a very innovative way and uh, that is going to be a real challenge and the real uh, mantra of success of implementation of climate action so this is all from my side and uh, uh, definitely i feel that the climate action has to uh, has to be done at the ground level right now we 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 are seeing that lot lot has been committed uh, in the conference of parties but it has to come down to gram panchayat level the lowest administrative unit of the state and the local solutions we we are also focusing upon the adaptation side to identify the local adaptive techniques which were already there and they have have been eliminated in due course of time so it it is a kind of low hanging fruit with very high uh, adaptive capacity so that uh, that is also uh, be bringing in strength to our capacity building uh, exercise in the state level thank you so much thank you mr tiwari we now have an input presentation on enablers of sap cc's knowledge network capacity building and finance by mr kirtiman avasti mr avasti is a climate change and sustainability professional and works as the senior policy advisor at jsf india he is responsible for climate change adaptation and climate finance readiness portfolios he has a long experience of strategic planning policy advice community support resource mobilization and knowledge management covering issues of climate adaptation and resilience climate risk management climate finance disaster risk reduction and sustainable development as part of bilateral multilateral and non governmental organizations over to you mr avasti uh can you see the slide please yes we can okay thank you so much and good morning everyone <clears throat> and thank you for providing me this opportunity to talk about some of the key enablers uh, that have emerged uh, for successful uh, operationalization of the sap cc at the state level i think one one thing is very clear uh, from three perspective one from the civil society perspective one from the international perspective and also one from the state perspective we just heard mr tiwari about the uh, sap cc being the 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 key uh, driver of uh, the sub national action at the state level uh so and then this as a primary vehicle of climate action uh, this has been clearly articulated also in the mofcc guidelines uh, for the sap cc revision and this uh, this also has been emphasized there in that and revision guide, uh, guidelines as well but sap cc as a primary vehicle for climate action is not just a primary vehicle in india in the in the domestic climate policy structure but also the role of subnational governments 
uh, has been recognized in UNFCCC process as well. And if I remember correctly, as early as in, in, in 2012, this, has his, this was clearly emphasized. And, uh, and I think th in, in this particular aspect, India was an early mover in, in going for a sub-national action plan as early as 2011, just after the national action plan on climate change. And we have Mr. Uh, Rashmi with us uh, in this webinar, uh, under whose guidance the whole effort uh, started uh, at that time, uh, that point of time in 2011 and 2012. And, and this early leadership shown by India on putting the SAPCC together found a lot of traction at the international level. And some of us uh, would have witnessed uh, this, this interest in the SAPCC process, subnational plus process, in the various side events on this topic of SAPCC, especially during the COP, the Climate Change Conference of Parties. And I think this importance of the SAPCCs and subnational action have all already been emphasized uh, by the speakers from different perspective. Uh, so I will skip that. But uh, now that SAPCCs are being revised and are being aligned to, to, uh, with the objectives of the nationally determined contribution at one level, and at the, so there are two kinds of integration that we see in the revision process. One, uh, the vertical integration with NDCs, and then some horizontal integration also with, uh, the, with, with other commitments like SDGs. So the states have their own vision documents of uh, 2020, uh, 2030, and then SAFCCs are also aligning uh, with those uh, commitments of sustainable development goal, as well as the related to disasters under the uh, Sendai framework. And that's why the SAFCC has actually become even more important uh, when it comes to its implementation going beyond the revision process. However, so uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, your slides are not moving forward. If you could check that, please. So this is the uh, overall climate policy framework. Uh, if I can, uh, if, if this is visible, the slide is visible now. And the reason for showing this uh, is, is specifically the vertical integration, which I was talking about. There's also horizontal into the SDGs and the Sendai framework, but also the vertical integration uh, with NDCs and also the national missions that we have. And the SAPCC revision also has these their own state-specific mission aligning with the national missions. And, but however, what we have seen some challenges with the implementation of SAPCC in the, in the earlier version as well. And I think those uh, challenges will remain uh, after the revision of SAPCC unless we address them uh, as a key, uh, key enabler for SAPCC implementation. And based uh, and one of the key enabler which uh, Mr. Tiwari clearly articulated is to further downs, uh, downscale, further localize SAPCC to the district level. And I think this is very important, uh, important for the state like Uttar Pradesh, but also other states as well, given the localized nature of climate impact and also the adaptation needs. So the moment we localize it further to district level, that creates a kind of enabling condition for its implementation uh, through different uh, means. And what are those, uh, what is the benefit when we further localize it? We can, we can talk about it later. But what we have found the key enablers is, is uh, the, sorry, before we move into the slide, one of the first enabler for me is the centrality of the nodal department as a coordinating agency for the SAPCC. And I think this is, uh, this thinking is evolving and, and in many states, the nodal agencies of climate, climate change nodal agencies are becoming, becoming central to the implementation of climate action or coordination of climate action. Why I'm saying coordination action? Because uh, as we look at the, the climate 
you know, climate uh, action, climate implementation, it requires engagement with different line departments, different other stakeholders, private sector and civil society. And that has become this central role of uh, nodal agencies become very important. And this is the first enabler. And I think there's a lot of support available uh, in, in this direction through the national missions as well and also through other uh, means uh, through bilateral cooperation and through multilateral cooperation as well. Uh, when we talk about localizing subsidies further to a district level, what will be again important is to create even more robust scientific evidence on, um, on, on vulnerabilities and risk. So SAPCC revision process provides the, the vulnerability assessment at the district level, climate projections for different scenarios, under different scenarios for the different timeline. And I think the localization, further localizing SAPCC uh, also requires further uh, detailed understanding of uh, uh, the climate vulnerabilities, uh, even at the village level. And some of the states actually have shown uh, uh, that that leadership in that direction, and one of the state is Himachal Pradesh, which which is creating a database of village level uh, vul uh, climate vulnerability to to have a more robust adaptation planning at the village level. The other uh, key aspect of the enabling condition is the multi stakeholder uh, engagement and partnership. Uh, this can be through uh, a knowledge network at the state level. Of course, we have talked about this at a national level, international level and, and the regional level. I think at the state level, uh, this needs to be promoted. And, and again, the states have taken leadership in creating such kind of a multi-stakeholder platforms to, to, to share experiences uh, and best practices uh, on uh, on adaptation, mitigation, promoting green starts, or promoting technologies uh, for, for climate action. Uh, Mr. Tiwari also talked about uh, this uh, financing SAPCC implementation uh, and need for uh, innovative ways for mobilizing both public and private climate finance. And one of the option that he talked about, talked about is, uh, is the green, uh, green bonds. For mitigation action, we have seen a lot of uh, interest from the private private sector. Uh, of course, it presents a business case as well. But on when it comes to adaptation action, this is primarily publicly uh, funded through public financing. And I think we need uh, some innovative ideas for blended financing or private financing or to create business opportunities in the adaptation sector as well. Uh, that is one to mobilize additional financing. But I think one of the biggest opportunities that exists on additional financing or uh, financing is to to integrate uh, climate concerns into the development plans uh, uh, of the state, state government. Uh, Mr. Tiwari again talked about the climate sensitivity assessment of the different program that the department has initiated. And I think that is one opportunity uh, that is clearly uh, uh, visible there. And once we localize the SAP CCs, uh, did, this creates an entry point for convergence of different funds of the different development schemes at the local level and, 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 and where the, these finances can be leveraged for adaptation and mitigation action uh, uh, both. I think. And when we further localize the other uh, enabler, which which will uh, support the implementation of SAPCC is, is to, to demonstrate and pilot some innovative and locally, locally suited technologies, both for adaptation and mitigation. When I say technologies, technology is not the hot technology, but also the techniques, the soft uh, uh, expertise, which is available for both uh, on adaptation and mitigation to to, to promote this idea of climate action and uh, sustainable development co benefits. Capacity development is one key enabler that, that has been identified uh, where, uh, as part of GIZ through Indo German cooperation, we have been working uh, with at the state level. And Uttar Pradesh is one of the states that we have partnered uh, along with Himachal Pradesh under the, uh, the ongoing project of climate adaptation and finance in rural India, Kafri. So capacity development 
at a different level of governance um, at the state level and the district level and further going down to the panchayat level as well. And capacity development also not just talking about the climate cons concerns and to sensitize about climate action, but also to, to make it more inclusive, more participatory, and also to make it gender responsive uh, when it comes to climate action. And one, uh, finally, the key enabler that I would like to focus is also about the m &E framework. Uh, m &E framework becomes important. Uh, sorry, I think I'm facing some glitches in my PPT. Developing framework, uh, many framework primarily because uh, it it allows us to prioritize climate action and tracking also the investment uh, uh, that is that is going into climate action, both adaptation and mitigation. And from that perspective, and then the SAPCC revision process also provides a clear guidance on having the MNE framework at the state level to to look at to track the progress of of climate action. And then creating an enabling environment in that direction is also become uh, it's also very important. And I think this finally uh, to sum up these enablers, uh, if we had to achieve these enablers, and I said I started uh, with, the, with the point of strengthening the role of nodal department for coordinated action. And uh, I would again like to reemphasize this this point again uh, that how this this nodal department are very important and we can. Um, further talk about this uh, role of model departments in the subsequent sessions. So thank you so much for, for uh, hearing me patiently. Thank you so much, Mr. Avasti. Uh, we will now begin with our panel discussion. The chair for today's session is Mr. R. R. Rashmi. Mr. Rashmi is He was India's key negotiator for climate change issues under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for several years and was associated with climate policy making in the run up to and after the Paris Agreement. As special secretary in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in the Government of India, he has been closely associated with the formulation and implementation of policies relating to climate change, pollution, Montreal Protocol and environmental clearances, besides also being the project director of the Green India Mission. Uh, over to you, Mr. Rashmi. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Riti, uh, for the introduction. And uh, once again, on behalf of Terry, let me welcome all of you to this very important session. Uh, uh, I would uh, begin by complimenting uh, uh, Kirtiman Navasti for his an excellent uh, presentation on the key enablers. Uh, <clears throat> and in, in developing this um, uh, template, uh, I'm sure he has received a support from a number of uh, thinking uh, persons. And uh, it is a great work. It's a great identification of the uh, key ideas which would uh, help us facilitate uh, the implementation of the SAPCCs. Uh, I would only like to add, since uh, the time is extremely short, I think we are left with about 40 minutes now uh, for the actual session and we have six speakers. Uh, I would like to just begin by saying that in addition to the five or six key enablers which he has mentioned. Uh, uh, to, to list the enablers which he mentioned was one was about downscaling the plans at the local level. Second was about identifying a nodal department uh, and uh, emphasizing a multi stakeholder dialogue or financing of the plans and mainstreaming of uh, the, the climate actions in every departmental program. And uh, lastly about the monitoring uh, and and uh, tracking framework. Uh, uh, the capacity, of course, he did mention, but I would like to only say that uh, the monitoring and uh, the, the measurement and the uh, monitoring framework also needs to be supported by some kind of a target based implementation uh, framework. Uh, if you see the evolution of the National Action Plan on Climate Change into NDCs, 
you will notice that the fundamental difference is that the climate actions in India have become now target based. It's not that the NAPCC has been jettisoned, it's still there. The, there are eight missions in the uh, National Action Plan on Climate Change and very soon uh, there are uh, one or two more going to be added formally. Um, um, but the fact remains that apart from a mission-oriented approach, the government is of India is also adopting a target-based approach for specific sectoral actions. So that is the major change. But, uh, the, but the, the issue of financing still uh, remains um, a major issue. So, uh, apart, so, so in addition to the uh, enablers, uh, I would say that every SAPCC which is going to be revised, um, when it indicates uh, m &E framework, it needs to be supported equally by uh, a, 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 a targets for each of the sectors which it is going to address. Uh, of course, there is a major uh, problem here because uh, uh, the large number of actions at the state level are adaptation oriented. They are not mitigation oriented, and and it's very difficult to identify uh, a framework for you know, measuring the benefits as far as adaptation are concerned. Even monitoring these the the adaptation actions and their benefits is extremely important. But that's a real challenge. So this will need to be grappled with as we uh, go along. Uh, uh, so so uh, it's an excellent template. And I would recommend that the states um, go forward on this. But we have um, uh, a number of uh, panelists today to give us their insights into how this can be done in a better and more effective manner. We have um, international examples. We have uh, examples from the state governments. Uh, and then we have six speakers who will be giving us their perspectives and insights into this matter. Uh, we have so let me first invite uh, Dr. Suresh uh, Kumar Atri, the principal scientific officer from the government of Himachal Pradesh. Himachal is one of the leading states as far as climate actions in India are concerned. Uh, Mr. Atri, you know, he is the the anchor of the uh, climate policy and uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh State Action Plan on Climate Change. He uh, has been at this work for the last 25 years and has done tremendous work. So uh, over to you, Mr. Athri. And uh, let me once again emphasize that we have just about um, uh, 40 minutes for the session and remaining uh, time for the question and answer. So I'll request each uh, speaker uh, to, to uh, you know, limit their remarks in uh, four to five minutes so that we can proceed with the discussion. Thank you and over to you, Mr. Athri. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm really delighted to you know meet you all once again uh, in uh, current year uh, 22, and uh, wish you all very happy new year. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, uh, for this uh, meeting that I'm also given opportunity to speak about uh, the perspective of uh, the Himalayan states and how we are uh, moving forward. Uh, yes, Himachal Pradesh uh, is one of the you know Himalayan states, and uh, uh, I'm not making a, a formal presentation. I'll be just speaking for two three minutes. Uh, so, uh, we we have already uh, prepared the second version of uh, uh, you know the state climate change action plan. And the first version we prepared in year uh, 2009, uh, uh, and it was uh, accepted and endorsed by ministry in uh, 2012. Uh, thereafter, uh, uh, after 10 years over the period, we had certain experiences and uh, in hand and uh, that how the different sectors and uh, how things evolved, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, simultaneously, uh, uh, how we collaborated and uh, how uh, the other sectors reacted uh, towards and how the science evolved in between. And then uh, we learned from that process and then with the help of, with the support of uh, uh, GIJ uh, and uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest, we were able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, release and prepare this uh, uh, second version of uh, uh, state climate change action plan in Himachal Pradesh. And probably we are the first state uh, in the entire Himalayan region or maybe in India uh, to uh, release that. Uh, and we released it in uh, uh, the month of uh, December only. Uh, so this, uh, in fact, uh, uh, 
the difference between the two is uh, primarily uh, focusing on you know the linkages uh, the priorities which the government of india has already endorsed uh, in the uh, it, uh, at the international level and uh, uh, the linkages between the ndcs and uh, uh, the sdgs uh, we have tried to uh, you know encompass over the uh, you know the adaptation as well as on the mitigation actions uh, through this action plan and we 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 have uh, uh, also tried to attempt to the uh, major issues of concern which are uh, very important relevant for the uh, uh, himachal pradesh and uh, the state economy and um, uh, linking them to these clearly linking them to the sdgs and the ndcs so uh, key priorities have been identified to um, we have certain experiences uh, uh, through this uh, the, uh, apart from the uh, you know uh, linkages uh, uh, what we felt as kirtiman mentioned that the one of the uh, important factor uh, in successful implementation of the state climate change action plan is the coordinating the nodal point the focal point uh, which should enable this implementation process so yes uh, we uh, have that uh, system in place with the uh, you know able guidance of the experts from the gij and ministry uh, we realize that the stakeholders uh, really required to understand the complexity of the climate change and the interlinkages among environmental and economic issues that is very important and that should be uh, given due uh, uh, you know uh, understanding so availability of data and information on different aspects is again a very big challenge and that needs to be clearly portrayed in the uh, climate change action plans uh, you know the gap in refined approaches uh, methodologies and yes the data sources from where you are picking up the data uh, so uh, there is no common platform for all these things so that needs to be developed and taken care of at the national level and or the at the regional level so uh, one thing which we also uh, noticed and importantly learned about is too many actions and you know action plans uh, goals without synergy creating confusion among uh, different stakeholders so that also needs to be ruled out and uh, looked after and looked into uh, when we prepare these kind of uh, uh, action plans there is a need of specific intervention uh, at the national level uh, uh, at for implementing Um, you know uh, for the implementing the action plans at the state level uh, or you know how to accord the uh, priorities at a common kind of framework should be developed or evolved that what we feel very strongly uh, financing of uh, you know uh, the climate change action plan is again a very big challenge how to internalize uh, with different sectors policies or programs ongoing programs that should be clearly spelled out linking with, uh, with with different sdgs uh, um, um, in the action plan so you know we also learned that you know the science based based planning for new kind of early warning systems uh, like in himalayan states the glof is very important or flood forecasting system should be prioritized as a policy based uh, you know how to scale up plans Uh, in different uh, you know uh, problem creating sectors like you know the plastic waste management or rain water harvesting or you know like uh, what are the different livelihood practices that could be so those kind of things uh, you know uh, how to scale up them uh, through these action plans uh, should be prioritized uh, uh, apart from you know the vulnerability assessment of different sectors uh, how do we account for and let people understand about the different complexity uh, uh, through these climate change impacts so with this i stop here uh, keeping in view uh, keeping in mind the time uh, limitations uh, uh, and i'll be available for any kind of uh, 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 questions uh, uh, from the uh, you know uh, participants thank you very much over to you sir thank you very much mr athri thanks very much for um, highlighting the importance of uh, and then the, the the reasons uh, behind the success of the himachal pradesh efforts Uh, they were the early birds in the uh, process and um, one of the uh, key elements uh, in their uh, the way they have framed the state actions is that they have identified a nodal department which is really very important uh, and then this has uh, helped them they have also done some work on the uh, accumulation of data 
but what is uh, driving uh, what is um, uh, a concern for all the states not just for himalayan states like uh, the one where mr athri is working is a national framework for financing the state action plans we will come to that shortly so the next speaker that i have on my list is mr helmut hojeski who is the head of the uh, department for general climate policy uh, in the austrian federal ministry for climate action environment energy mobility innovation and technology so he has a very large charge uh, under him and he is practically looking after all the important um, uh, aspects of the economic system in his country and austria remains a major uh, country uh, which has demonstrated uh, successful climate actions so it will be good to learn from uh, him about the best practices that he has uh, his country has employed and whether uh, states in india can learn from that so over to you mr kojeski yeah thank you very much for your uh, kind um, introduction and uh, happy to to share uh, the austrian views uh, on state action plan revision and implementation yeah let me start off uh, of course austria is one of the 27 member states so we are embedded in the overall european uh, climate change policy uh, so uh, for for us it's uh, equally important uh, that we uh, touch on mitigation but also on adaptation these are the two uh, columns of climate policy and they are equally important uh, so i would like to start off with this of course um, um it was mentioned that uh, targets uh, are important uh, especially for mitigation for adaptation is a bit uh, more difficult but for mitigation um, we have uh, the european framework uh, the european green deal uh, so uh, talking about uh, eu wants to be climate neutral by 2050 and uh, we have quite tough targets so enhanced ndcs for for 2030 what we do in austria we have uh, um, even stricter uh, national targets uh, in austria we would like to be climate neutral uh, so net zero emissions already by 2040 and uh, what we did we have uh, sectoral uh, targets uh, for each year uh, yeah we started already in in 2013 uh, up to 2030 this is uh, just uh, in the uh, legislative procedure for the next 10 years but this is important uh, to measure your implementation along um, fixed uh, sectoral targets and we have to be aware of that we have a split between emissions trading and uh, the sectors outside the emissions trading scheme which is uh, mainly mobility uh, buildings uh, waste uh, agriculture yeah um, our experience with all the plans uh, behind uh, these uh, legal requirements uh, is uh, that it is important to have a broad uh, participation by the civil society and its representatives so what we do on mitigation on adaptation is uh, to have a, a committees a working groups uh, where all the relevant ministries on the federal level all the nine provinces of austria are represented and also uh, the civil society via the so called social partners it's the chamber of commerce uh, the agricultural chamber the chamber of labor the trade union and also environment ngos so to have a broad uh, basis where we can work and uh, we have recently uh, just uh, three weeks ago established uh, a climate council of citizens uh, they meet uh, six uh, weekends uh, until beginning of summer and have to develop uh, um uh, suggestions for the government to uh, to move on 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 climate so our strategies are the national energy and climate plan the national adaptation strategy a long term strategy for 2050 and now we are working on the strategy for 2040 and uh, this is uh, the the framework where, where we work important uh, for all these uh, activities uh, is uh, that you have to assure responsibility for all the different levels 
um, to uh, share information between uh, these levels, to foster cooperation, uh, and uh, to establish a, a system of monitoring and evaluation. So for mitigation, as I said, these sectoral uh, reduction pathways are the benchmark. For adaptation is a bit more difficult. We, uh, we uh, established a system of criteria uh, where we try to measure the uh, progress in adaptation measures. And uh, this is also supported by um, support schemes. So we rely on, on a tandem of, of uh, legal uh, requirements of so more command and control and incentives, uh, subsidies for, for the public uh, and for businesses, for entities uh, to move on with, uh, with climate change. So that's uh, the idea. And uh, finally, I have to mention um, we will introduce a CO2 price uh, mid of this year because it's definitely key that there's a price signal that uh, the use of fossil uh, energy uh, shall be uh, uh, more expensive than the use of renewable energies. So this uh, will be introduced by a fix, uh, fixed CO2 price of, of 30 euro a ton uh, beginning of uh, 1st of July this year. And then it, uh, um, it moves on to, to 35 uh, euro next year and then in uh, 10 euro uh, jumps. And we envisage an introduction of a domestic uh, uh, emissions trading scheme for, for transport and buildings and all other uh, related uh, fossil uh, fuel emissions uh, starting from 2026 onwards. So all this is, uh, is important and uh, to the bridge uh, the, uh, the reasoning uh, why I'm speaking as a mountainous uh, country, we are a landlocked country, as I said, a federal country with nine provinces. And there are definitely a lot of different landscapes uh, which we have to cover. And we are really happy that all the nine regions uh, in Austria have their uh, the regional plans for mitigation, for adaptation, which, uh, are, which feed in into the federal plans. And uh, we have also incentives for the local level, uh, so for local communities uh, to establish uh, climate and energy managers. And uh, we also uh, foster uh, climate uh, adaptation model regions where at least two communities have to join forces and uh, move on uh, on adaptation. So in this way, we try to reflect the different uh, situation in Austria. Yeah, let me stop here. I think uh, time is running and uh, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ajewski, for uh, giving us a glimpse of of what the government of Austria is doing, uh, considering its uh, uh, territorial uh, location. Uh, uh, but uh, you did tell us that you have a, a citizens council uh, for climate and uh, you have regional plans. So it more or less um, buttresses the point made by Kirith Manavasti and uh, also by Mr. Atri earlier that the uh, institutional structure is very important in advancing climate awareness and building up efforts. Of course, mitigation remains a primary focus in your country, uh, but in uh, developing countries, the focus will have to be a little different and newer ways uh, in uh, institutional structures will have to be evolved to deal with that problem. Uh, we have uh, the other uh, dimension of state action in uh, coastal states. You know, India is a large country which has hills, which has um, states on the coast, which has uh, states in the arid region, states in the northeastern part, heavily forested states. So we have an example of uh, a coastal state from Gujarat. And Gujarat, if you uh, um, let me tell you, is one of the leading states as far as climate action is concerned. In fact, Gujarat was the first state in India to develop uh, a climate action uh, plan. So let me invite uh, Mr. Shwetal Shah, who is the advisor of the Department of Climate Change in Gujarat 
and has worked for, on this subject for almost 14 years uh, in different positions. Let me invite him for his uh, brief ideas about what does he think can enable the states to implement an effective action plan uh, for climate. And uh, I'll request him to be brief and uh, be uh, conclude within five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, very important uh, tone setting has been done in today's meeting. And uh, I'm also thankful to Terry and GIZ for organizing this uh, conference uh, for identifying sub-national level uh, priorities. Uh, and as sir rightly said, uh, Gujarat is a coastal state. Uh, Gujarat is also an industrial state. Uh, and Gujarat uh, is also a growing uh, state with urban population. So we have several challenges uh, simultaneously. Uh, we also have the shortfall of uh, uh, water supply. Uh, so different uh, adaptation initiatives that we have uh, taken in the state of Gujarat are uh, very important for uh, 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 climate action. And uh, disaster management is also very important being a coastal state. So if I say very briefly, uh, we have a 1600 kilometer long coastline that is uh, highest in the country. So uh, we have uh, almost our 40% of our population is near to uh, coastal area. Uh, we have uh, around 40 uh, minor and major ports uh, on, on this coastal area. This coastal area is very uh, important for uh, uh, our economy. Uh, not only for the economy of the state, but also for entire country, uh, because uh, a major portion of our import and export happens at Gujarat uh, ports, uh, because all uh, northern states of India are landlocked. So uh, they use Gujarat as a gateway for their uh, economic activities. Uh, the coastal area has also benefit of uh, very good uh, uh, wind potential. So Gujarat is having one of the uh, very best uh, wind potential after the state of uh, Tamil Nadu and other coastal state. Uh, and Gujarat has also been proactive in harnessing uh, this renewable energy, uh, which is in terms of uh, solar as well as wind. So we stand uh, third in uh, <coughs> installed capacity uh, at the state level uh, in India in solar energy. Uh, we stand second with around nine uh, gigawatt of installed capacity of wind. We have potential of uh, around, uh, say, uh, 85 to 90 gigawatt of uh, wind energy. We also have a huge potential of offshore uh, wind energy uh, that is not commercially viable presently, but has a very great uh, potential in coming time. And we know that uh, some of our uh, uh, peers from European countries have similar experience in uh, harnessing uh, offshore wind energy and definitely we can uh, learn and we can uh, exchange our experience with them uh, since uh, our European country partners are uh, here in this platform. Uh, we also have a very good uh, say implementation of solar rooftop uh, uh, system uh, in the state of Gujarat. We are number one in installation of uh, solar rooftop uh, scheme. So this uh, solar rooftop program is supported by uh, National uh, Solar Mission, which is part of National Action Plan on Climate Change. And in our state action plan, we also have given priority to uh, renewable energy. Uh, we also have given a great emphasis to uh, disaster management. And uh, recent, in recent years, we have seen that uh, uh, the frequency and intensity of some of the coastal disasters have tremendously uh, increased. And uh, that is uh, being addressed with, uh, with a very uh, detailed uh, planning at the uh, grassroots level. And we, we know that uh, in coming time, uh, these are some of the challenges that we are going to face. So. Uh, the uh, early warning system for uh, such disaster uh, is uh, very important and uh, community mobilizing uh, is uh, again important in uh, such scenario and uh, we have uh, demonstrated a good 
uh, strategy in these areas. A uh, sea level rise uh, <clears throat> is also again going to be very important. Uh, salinity increase. So there are uh, certain estimates which uh, shows that uh, uh, a different level of sea level rise. Uh, what uh, economic loss and damage we are going to face. So we have identified those areas uh, which are low lying and uh, which require a special attention so that we can uh, prepare a vulnerable assessment and uh, strategic uh, planning uh, for those areas for coming decades. Uh, we are also committed to the uh, Panchamri uh, that has been announced by our Honorable Prime Minister at COP26 and net zero is one of the key uh, say strategy for coming time. So there's a line uh, priorities and activities in those direction which reduces the emission intensity of our uh, GDP and also increase the renewable energy penetration across the sector. Apart from uh, energy, there are several uh, sectors which have the uh, emissions, which includes the industry, uh, land use change uh, and uh, forestry, which acts as a sink. Uh, and if uh, uh, land use is also uh, and industrial processes are also say uh, sources of GHG. So how we can uh, mitigate uh, those uh, emissions are also being taken care under our state action plan. So we have already submitted uh, our state action plan to government of India last year. And, uh, and we seek uh, support of uh, all uh, stakeholders at the national level as well as international level to come and work with us uh, in Gujarat and to, to address these uh, priority areas which has been identified under nine thematic areas in the state action plan on climate change. And we are uh, really thankful to European Union and GIZ for extended, uh, extending their uh, support under various scheme as uh, told by uh, Mr. Edwin today morning. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for um, highlighting the uh, way the state actions are progressing in Gujarat. Uh, they have given emphasis on uh, renewable energy generation, disaster management, and also the emissions from industries. So they are uh, plans are fully in sync with the national action plan and national uh, goals. But Guj Gujarat has the advantage of being a relatively developed state, uh, a state which is fully conscious and uh, a lot of resources. Uh, so uh, let me now try and understand from the um, other um, um, uh, side of the, uh, are the, the Europe uh, as to how uh, coastal states can have uh, experimented their actions um, in this field. Uh, to explain uh, this to us is Mr. Magnus Sederloff, who is the senior advisor in the Ministry of Environment in Finland. And he has been dealing with the climate for a number of years since 1995. So he has a lot of, he has a wealth of experience on the subject. And it will be good to listen to him to understand how actions in coastal states can be advanced uh, to, to implement uh, climate strategy. Over to you, Mr. Sederloff. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and uh, uh, thank you also uh, for the kind invitation to this conference and uh, for the possibility to uh, share with you the experiences and practices uh, in Finland from national uh, climate policy planning. Uh, the basis uh, for our national climate policy is uh, the general targets included in the Paris Agreement and uh, also in the EU European Union's climate legislation, which uh, Mr. Odjeski already referred to. Uh, EU has since uh, 2002 legislation for the so-called emissions trading. Uh, sector which works nowadays on the on the EU level and covers industry and and uh, uh, energy production. Uh, 
Uh, nowadays, we have also uh, other uh, pieces of EU legislation covering uh, other sectors of so, the society. And uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, uh, the so-called effort sharing legislation is important as this has been the basis for our uh, mid-term uh, uh, climate policy planning. And uh, we have taken our uh, national targets uh, for the midterm from from this uh, EU legislation. That means that uh, when it comes to emission reduction targets, we are working now with the uh, 39% emission reduction target uh, uh, by uh, 2030 uh, compared to 2005 levels. And I'm now uh, concentrating with my remarks on, on this uh, uh, midterm uh, mitigation uh, planning. We have a national uh, climate act in place in Finland since 2015. And uh, this mm -hmm. act actually established a climate policy planning scheme according to which we are working nowadays. Uh, our first mid-time uh, policy uh, uh, plan was uh, drawn up in 2017 by the government and uh, uh, thereafter also submitted to the parliament and discussed by the parliament. Uh, we uh, had as a starting point uh, 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 to achieve the 2030 uh, emission reduction uh, target in, in that plan. And uh, we have to draw up a new midterm plan every four uh, years. So we are now working on, on a revision of, of, of this uh, plan. Uh, we use uh, uh, very much uh, scenario methodology, uh, which essentially means that uh, we first look at, at the measures we have in place already and how far we can get in terms of reaching the target with the present measures. And uh, then we uh, make uh, assessments of the amount of uh, how much additional measures we will need in order to uh, reach uh, uh, policy scenario. And our main method for identifying these new policy measures which we need uh, has been to apply a uh, bottom-up approach. This means that we have uh, been screening potential measures sector by sector and uh, then in a st uh, second stage, we add these uh, sector-based measures together uh, in order to check the sufficiency with uh, regard to the overall emission reductor, uh, reduction target. So it's basically an iterating uh, procedure uh, uh, whereby we, we check that uh, we have a, a compilation of uh, policy measures which will be uh, enough uh, to reach the overall uh, target and then we also uh, apply a safety margin uh, in order to to ensure uh, reaching uh, the target. The main criteria uh, when we evaluate the uh, so-called goodness of, of the different policy measures is cost efficiency and fairness. And in some cases, of course, these two criteria could be somewhat uh, uh, hard to combine. Uh, and there is also uh, uh, different methodological uh, uh, issues uh, 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 concerning uh, how to evaluate these uh, criteria. Uh, we also take into account uh, when we uh, try to look at the fairness, uh, how the measures uh, affect income distribution and uh, what regional impacts the, the different measures have. Uh, mentioning one important sector is, of course, transport, uh, which is very uh, uh, dominating. Uh, yeah, in, I, I, in sorry. No, I was just okay. saying that uh, we can uh, quickly summarize this. 
Yes, yes. I, I could sum up uh, by saying that uh, uh, we uh, are trying to involve different uh, uh, stakeholders in, in our processes and uh, we have different consultation processes ensuring that everybody have uh, a possibility to uh, to have their say in, in the planning process and this involves also the local municipalities. Uh, in the interest of time, I will stop here and uh, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Sedalov, for your inputs on the <clears throat> processes uh, uh, undertaken in the uh, Finnish government. Uh, so this will uh, help us uh, form our views better. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we now go to uh, the the other type of states in India, which are heavily uh, urbanized, I, if you can characterize them. So they are urban in nature. They are they are, they are um, highly developed states. They are having uh, better industries, better industrial infrastructure, and Delhi and um, Tamil Nadu are good examples of this. So I'll now like to invite Mr. K. S. Chai Chandran, who is Special Secretary Environment in the Government of Delhi, and he's uh, an officer of Indian Forest Service of uh, 15 years of uh, seniority. Uh, he has done a number of, I mean, a large amount of work in the forest related uh, sectors, but uh, being in Delhi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you, had, you lost your audio for the last uh, five, five, ten seconds. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no. I was just requesting you to, to to give your thoughts in four to five minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. How Delhi government views this? Yeah. So, uh, so I got a very tiny presentation. I mean, uh, so just to keep my discourse very structured. Uh, so I will wind up in four and a half, uh, five minutes in this presentation. Am, am I allowed to share? Okay, uh, yes, sir. I think you will have to do. You. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, a very good morning to all the. Uh, participants here and uh, eminent uh, panelists here. So Delhi has just now uh, started the revision exercise of uh, our state action plan on climate change. And uh, we had a climate agenda way back in 2010 and uh, 9-10, uh, which was sort of a I mean, climate mitigation and adaptation plan. And uh, Delhi was the first state in the country to do so. But uh, on expiry of the agenda, a state action plan was also released in January 2019 on the lines of the NAPCC. But now uh, the same plan has been revised to synergize with the NDCs. And uh, when we kind of look at the trends, we analyze the trends, uh, especially the temperature trend, we find that uh, the projection reflects an upward scaling in Delhi. And the median value of the annual maximum temperature will be 33 degrees centigrade, and the minimum will be around 20 by 2050. When we look at the rainfall, it uh, reveals a negative trend, indicating that the total amount of rainfall uh, likely to be received is likely to have a decrease in trend. So, uh, uh, so since it's very kind of a concerning trend which you are uh, seeing in the projections, we have identified some key sectors of the vulnerability assessment that is health, energy, water resources, urban planning, transport, agriculture, forest and biodiversity. So, I'll just quickly go through these uh, sectors and. Uh, just highlight the key uh, key uh, interventions which are planning now, both in terms of the mitigation and the adaptation pillars. So in health, we are kind of targeting around five uh, missions or schemes, be the state health mission or the Nehru Sehat Yojana, the diabetes and hypertension screening of urban slums in Delhi, the integrated disease surveillance project, and the revised tuberculosis control program. 
and the key mitigation measures which we are trying to propose in the in the revised action plan which is likely to be released in the next month uh, so here we are going to develop a early warning system for disease outbreak outbreaks sponsor r and d on vaccines and uh, providing low cost vaccination and also environment based health advisories and as far as uh, adaptation measures prevention and control of six vector borne diseases uh, malaria dengue kalasar and so on also we are also kind of uh, proposing skill development program for doctors and paramedical we look at energy ujala slnp and perform achieve and trade cycle others a key areas we are trying to concentrate and the measures which we are proposing is replacing uh, the conventional lighting system with energy efficient systems appliance replacement program uh, to promote star rated appliances building construction to introduce kind of green building technologies and uh, for in the adaptation measures r and d projects for production and use of biofuels we look at uh, water resources yemuna has been uh, a very top priority for delhi and hence the action plan to curb the water pollution of the river is I mean, uh, is on top of the water resources agenda and also includes augmentation and sustainability of water resources and jan jal prabandhan yojana so here the mitigation measures we're looking at reusing the waste water connecting all the houses to the existing sewer system still there are a lot of house out of outside the sewer bracket so in, uh, treatment of uh, industrial effluents and protecting the flood plains of uh, river yamuna adaptation recycling plants then we are also proposing metering and charges on groundwater withdrawal and strengthening our regulations uh, for groundwater management and augmentation urban planning master planning is the, the master plan 2041 is been finalized the digital uh, mapping project the ban on the plastic uh, carry bags solid waste management rules and the construction demolition waste so here when I mean, we are going to kind of highlight the environmental services uh, offered by land in the master plan and the zonal development plan and energy audits and environmental impact assessment for large buildings in adaptation uh, recycling of uh, construction waste is a high priority uh, activity and kind of uh, having a hot spot strategy to control air pollution is also equally important transport mrts uh, and ev policy delhi aspires to become the ev capital of the country and we have a very proactive ev policy and um, and the government is pushing hard to kind of uh, transition conventional transport to uh, the ev transport and towards the direction development of rrts i mean uh, i mean uh, a proactive uh, enforcement of uh, ev uh, ev uh, vehicles adaptation we, we are trying to promote low carbon fuels discouraging private vehicles especially ic engine vehicles uh, in, and imposition of charge on light and heavy duty commercial vehicles which are entering delhi uh and uh, the final pillar would be the forest and biodiversity uh when delhi being one of the greenest capitals in the entire world we have an action plan on greening delhi uh, which would include afforestation and also uh, mapping of uh, water bodies water bodies also there is substantial amount of work been done in delhi for example listing these water bodies around 1000 water bodies in delhi listing them and kind of giving legal protection statutory protection to all these water bodies and also to kind of i um, mean um, uh, propose uh, low cost rejuvenation techniques low cost rest restoration techniques which are environment friendly to the landscape of delhi so financing is um, in most of the action proposed are been routed through ongoing schemes but significant funds and finances are available to the central government of india which which are been explored for proposed climate actions for addition to climate also the state will be seeking financial and technical support from international organization of bilateral thing and innovative climate financing instruments are being explored for which we are seeking collaboration with uh, expert knowledge partners so what are the key takeaways from this present uh, revision exercise is that uh, the state governments are very low on capacity so knowledge partnership is very important for any state which is uh, thinking about revising their plans and uh, climate being uh, a very general kind of uh, um, area there are multiple departments and their priorities totally vary and so it's very important to kind of harmonize for the the nodal department to kind of harmonize all the priorities of the departments and also to give this climate actions um, to the stakeholder uh, making them own uh, the climate action plan so that uh, the 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 implementation is um, is good and it's also important to kind of have targets that are realistic we uh, are feasible and also objective so that they are easily monitored thank you so much
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yachandran, uh, uh, for a brief glimpse about the State Action Plan of Delhi. Let me now go to uh, Ms. R. Smitha, uh, who is Secretary to the Government in the Union Territory of Puducherry. Uh, Terry is fortunate or rather privileged to uh, be working with the Union Territory of Puducherry in uh, devising their State Action Plan. And um, uh, Ms. Smitha has, <clears throat> is, is a senior uh, civil servant uh, from the Indian Administrative Service, and he has lots of experience on the subject because she's also the chairman of the uh, Puducherry Pollution uh, Control Committee. She's also on the Coastal Zone Management Authority. So um, uh, let's hear from her as to how the Union Territory is dealing with this issue. Over to you, Smitha. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Reshmi. Uh, very uh, warm regards to all the participants. Uh, I, I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? You are, you are audible. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be part of this World Sustainable Development Summit and um, share, to share my experiences on drafting the revised action plan on climate change for the YouTube Puducherry. I also appreciate Terry's efforts in man, um, organizing this event along with GISN and having participants from across the globe. I would like to tell you that the YouTube Puducherry comprises of four geographically known contiguous regions. Uh, so they are spread apart and so having a common climate action plan for these regions taking into consideration the geographical distances is a task in front of us. So we have done a very recent climate profiling for the state that shows the average temperature in Puducherry is projected to rise by one degree Celsius by mid-century. Also, it is projected that the state is going to experience increased high intensity rainfall by mid-century. This is quite obvious when the amount of rain that we have received in the last two years, everyone has heard of the Chennai um, floods also. So regional studies on sea level also indicates a rise of 18 centimeters in the mean sea level at the middle of the century in the Puducherry. In view of the high climate vulnerabilities, the Union Territory needs to have a robust action plan on climate change for making the region climate resilient. So the first SAPCC for Puducherry Union Territory was framed in 2030 and uh, 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 it, while uh, yielding the benefits of addressing climate change effectively. Apart from the seven missions identified under NAPCC, a new mission on coastal and disaster management was included as this is a coastal region and we have seen a lot of disaster related to coastal areas in this region. Over the years, the first SAPCC faced challenges in implementation mostly due to fund constraints but we were able to make a lot of progress with the help of World Bank and Government of India uh, they have supported the Coastal Disaster Risk Reduction Project uh, and uh, also Ministry of Earth Sciences has funded a pilot project on the Puducherry Beach which has helped us to restore the old beach um, uh, which is being appreciated all around the country. We were also able to access some adaptation funds from the Ministry of uh, Environment for climate proofing of water sector in the region. I would like to say that a dedicated uh, climate change cell was created with the support of the Department of Science and Technology Government of India under the National Mission on Strategic Knowledge on Climate Change, which spearheads the climate in initiatives in the UT. At present, we are carrying out the revision of the state action plan in synergy with the goals of nationally determined contributions for post-2020 committed by the Government of India and the SDGs. Puducherry SAPCC 2.0 envisions a long-term strategy for upscale and effective climate actions for the next years with cl clear financial roadmaps and well-rounded institutional capacities. We have partnered with UNEP India and uh, Terry for the preparation of SAPCC 2.0. The revision will address the various gaps in the earlier SAPCC like lack of comprehensive vulnerability assessment, regional level climate projections, proper financial planning, etc. A strong institutional mechanism has been created, which was lacking early with the climate change cell. Uh, we have our state level steering committee, which is chaired by the chief secretary to government. A working group consisting of nodal officers from 16 key government departments has been formed and uh, uh, consecutive meetings are held so that uh, we are able to obtain their views and the concerns of the, those departments also. 
we have identified electrification of public transport uh, puducherry is a small town but uh, the density of uh, vehicles is more then uh, renewable energy uh, and water resources also have been identified as key sectors to be emphasized the existing barriers are being studied and strategies for future are being developed the idea of electrification of public transport was adapted in line with the national electric mobility mission and we are trying to identify the scope of electrification of transport sector through assessing the potential of electrification of public transport identifying potential funding resources and subsidies also a road map for renewable energy is framed with the idea of to mainstream renewable energy i would like to point out that uh, puducherry is the one unique territory which meant for a very um, noble solar policy in the country and this solar policy also has included a uh, group net metering so um, for puducherry major consumption of electricity is with the power sector and we are totally dependent on power from the outside so product, uh, promotion of renewable energy will be making us uh, rely rely on uh, solar energy which is uh, which is a very good uh, capacity is available so a comprehensive road map of renewable energy and implementation is helping in efficiently implementing the idea of electrification of public transport and use of renewable energy in electrified public transport the other idea on water resources focuses on rejuvenation and maintenance of lakes and ponds in puducherry in order to restore and conserve the ground water of puducherry puducherry is mostly dependent on ground water for its drinking water supply and also agriculture and the salination and intrusion of uh, sea water as creating problems in the quality of water so the mission want, wants to address this uh, issue also we have taken initiatives on desilting of lakes and ponds mandating rainwater harvesting mechanism in all garden buildings construction of check dams and bed dams in river channels encouraging alternate cropping patterns and water efficient agricultural practices to reduce the water st stress in agricultural sector with all the positives the process of revision of sapcc had to address few challenges as well the primary challenge being the lack of availability of necessary data making it difficult to carry out a comprehensive study undertaking effective climate actions largely depend on mobilization of finance capacity building needs of the government agencies involved is another area which needs more focus despite the challenges we are going ahead with the revision and uh, we hope that we will be able to uh, develop a robust sapcc once again i want to thank all of you for the opportunity that is being given thank you so much thank you smita thank you very much for outlining the key areas and the areas of emphasis in the state action plan of U United Union Territory of Puducherry and uh, of course i noted the point that the there is a dedicated climate change cell uh, which is driving the whole actions so thank you very much uh, the last speaker today uh, i mean in fact we have already run out of our time but uh, we uh, we would like to hear the last speaker dr ancha c burger who is the councillor of climate and environment embassy of the federal republic of germany we are uh, thankful for the support given by the government of germany and the giz uh, for this entire session so over to you dr burger thank you so much chair colleagues friends um, i really try to be very short and to um, strengthen to to shorten my my presentation which is a small speech um, <clears throat> The new 2000 version of the Energy Transition and Climate Protection Act of the Federal Republic of Germany, following the European Green Deal, the EU Fit for 55 package and the ruling of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, has developed new targets. First, that greenhouse gas emission nationwide are to be reduced by at least 65 percent by 2030 and at least 80 80 by 2040 compared to 1990 levels and by 2045 we aim to be greenhouse gas neutral and also the climate policy legislative competence on climate in federal germany lies at the federal level the 16 federal states have also taken action within their scope to achieve greenhouse gas neutrality so I'm from Baden-Württemberg, that's um, um, a large um, German state, we call it land, um, at the southwest. And I would just like to give you, as an example, the Climate Action Plan 
um, of Baden-Württemberg. And I just pick out one, two elements. Um, Baden-Württemberg is both urban and rural. And you might know the capital of Baden-Württemberg is Stuttgart. This is um, where the Mercedes-Benz comes from. And it's also famous for its Indian Film Festival because there's a <clears throat> partnership with Mumbai. <clears throat> so the legal framework of the state climate protection up by Baden-Württemberg already came onto force um, in 2030. It was one of the early birds, but not the first. The first was, was not on Westphalia. And last year it was comprehensively further developed. Um, and in 2001, um, well, actually 2020, it was um, comprehensively developed and last year fall, it passed Parliament of Baden-Württemberg. So um, the main difference between the federal um, new climate law and the um, Baden-Württemberg climate law is that it wants to reach climate neutrality even five years earlier, like Austria in 2014. And the government of Baden-Württemberg uses regular monitoring to check whether the climate protection targets have been achieved. And if it becomes apparent that they will not be achieved, the state government decides on additional measures. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me pick out something which is really relevant for the urban areas, that's photovoltaic. And um, it was decided that um, <clears throat> And with regard to photovoltaic, that um, new goals have to be reached and they have already started. So the, when it comes to the new construction of non-residential buildings, since 1st January, January of this year, a photovoltaic system has to be applied and new construction of residential, residential buildings from 1st May this year and um, from 1st January next year, um, in, when it comes to a fundamental roof renovation, you need a photovoltaic system. And also from January this year, when there is a new construction of parking slots. So I think this is quite um, interesting. Also the, the monitoring systems, they have yearly reports, every three reports, every five years reports, it, it really focuses on different um, areas. Adaptation is a very important part. And um, <clears throat> I think, um, well, it's, it's not all of the states have developed um, climate laws, but the majority and the Baden-Württemberg law can be found on the net in English and in French. And I think that's a, it's a good knowledge sharing experience also for the Indian states. And since decades, as already mentioned by, by the chair and also by my colleagues from GAZ, EU, Germany and India are working closely together in the field of climate and environment. We share common value and goals and Germany provides yearly more than 1 billion euro towards India in the field of climate and environment through technical cooperation and financial cooperation, in particular through GSZ and KFW, but also Terry, for example. And I would also like to, to highlight um, the activities of the International Climate Initiative um, in the field of mitigation and adaptation. Well, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany is keen to support the endeavors of the Indo-German Development Cooperation and Terry in the coming years. And I wish you all success for this marvelous event. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Berger, for your comments and highlighting the, <clears throat> the efforts which are uh, being made by one of your federal states uh, in your regional um, units uh, in advancing climate actions. Uh, that was really uh, great to hear about the, the additional efforts and additional goals which uh, your state has made. Uh, so we have, with this, we have come to the end of this session, this wonderful session where we have had a number of perspectives. Uh, we wanted to have a question and answer session, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. Uh, so uh, allow me the privilege of, uh, you know, Summarizing, uh, which I think what we have learned from today's session is that it's it's very important to have um, you know, four or five 
uh, key um, things in the state uh, to be really able to advance uh, the state actions on climate change. <clears throat> different states have different priorities, which many of the speakers have highlighted in their presentation. But what uh, is a running theme, which is common to all of them, that they have built institutions and a proper institutional framework to prepare and guide these actions. And that is a common theme. So it's very important to have a strong institutional framework. There is absolutely no doubt. Uh, some of the European states, of course, have climate laws in their country. Uh, uh, to, 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 to be fair uh, to these in states in India, India doesn't have a climate law. So states can't have a climate law at this moment. But many of the states have started adopting a carbon neutrality as their goal. Like Himachal, for example, has, uh, state of Bihar has, uh, so uh, Ladakh has. Uh, so many states have adopted this. So once they, they have a, an, a proper institutional structure, even in the absence of a climate law, I think these institutions can help mainstream the climate goals into their actions, provided adequate resources are available. So that is the other enable, the key enabling um, factor, which is going to uh, ensure the sustainability of these climate actions at the state level. So there is some funding available at the state level, but I think the in the in the long run, the resources will have to be mobilized uh, with the help of the private sector as well. And for that, we will need to create good business models, both in the mitigation sector as well as uh, adaptation sector. And uh, there are institutions, again, at the national level available for this. We have a national adaptation plan. We have a CDRI, which is built um, in helping states and in different countries to create uh, climate resilient infrastructure. So the, the key challenge here is to mobilize adequate finance. And the last, uh, but not the least, is to have a clear target for uh, implementing these actions. I would also end that uh, the one uh, dimension which all states must adequately take care of, uh, I'm sure they are all doing this because in the case of Himachal and uh, um, um, and Delhi and other uh, and Puducherry also we noted this that they have had consultations with various stakeholders. This is really going to be important for the success of the plans in future because even if we are able to um, mobilize resources and enhance our climate goals, if we don't have the support of the communities, the people who are going to be affected by the climate change, uh, the, uh, so they will not be able to support our climate actions. So uh, uh, let me end by saying that uh, we uh, wish all the states who are uh, doing great work, uh, the, uh, uh, we convey their best wishes in uh, having a good targeted uh, climate action in their states and all other states uh, provided we are able to build this required template of enablers, which we have just discussed. So thank you very much. Let me thank all the panelists once again for their extremely insightful thoughts and their interventions and wish you all the best. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. I think we had a very engaging discussion. And on behalf of Terry, I would like to extend my gratitude to all the dignitaries from different parts of India and the world who've come to today's session despite their busy schedule. I would also like to thank our partners, GIZ and EU, for their support in organizing this thematic track. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the WSDS team for their efforts in bringing us all together for a very wonderful event. We invite you to attend other plenary sessions and thematic tracks in the summit. Thank you all for being here and enjoy the summit. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.